Good morning, folks. Good to be with you on this Tuesday morning for devotions. Hope and pray that your week has been going well so far and uh, looking forward to uh, just to sharing some thoughts this morning. And hopefully, you know, we've been looking a little bit lately, I guess, uh, a lot along the lines of doctrine, uh, you know, eschatology and things of that nature. And so this morning, I thought what we'd do is hopefully be a little bit more, uh, not that doctrine's not practical, but just some life practical application here. Michael, good morning. So uh, we're in Proverbs chapter 30 this morning. If you're following along in your Bible, if you're not, that's fine. Just have a listen. But uh, we're going to look at uh, verse 24 where, he, where God says, There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Judy, good morning. You know, one thing that you think about, uh, well, one thing that we all should think about when it comes to God is that with God, size doesn't matter. Size doesn't matter. In in the world in which we live, the bigger something is, the more impressive it is, the better it is. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the uh, the, the the bigger the size of the church, it must be, you know, and, you know, pastors who pastor smaller churches are like, oh, you come to us and we'll show you what to do. And and uh, there's a, uh, there is a, uh, uh, I don't know whether it is a, um, not so much a teaching, but more of a philosophy, I guess, that, uh, and it started back in the days of Hiles, where Hiles, Jack Hiles, and he would have uh, preachers preaching in his conference that were pastoring churches of a thousand, so that, you know, and all this sort of thing, and you would learn from them, and and the, and the poor guy who pastors a small church doesn't really get to preach, hey Jack, good morning, doesn't get to preach in these big conferences, well, you know, the, the small church pastor probably is just as an effective preacher as the larger church pastor and maybe more so. So the, what I'm saying is this, size with God doesn't matter. You know, the, the, the size of a the, the size of a object, the size of a creature, the size of an army, the size of a person. In the eyes of God, it doesn't matter. Um, this, as a matter of fact, the smaller the army, if you you know you read your Bible, the smaller the army, the greater. Like God says, yeah, now I can use you, Gideon, for example. Uh, Zacchaeus was small of stature, but he climbed that tree. You know what I mean? And uh, the, you know, again, the, the size of a church. Well, we would class A as a small church. You know, in the in the eyes and hands of God, it doesn't matter the size. Um, so, you know, we've got to be careful that when we think about the size of something, we do, just don't dismiss it because it's not something big. You know what I mean? Like there are a lot of cults out there that are big, but it doesn't make them right. And you think of the Mormon church and so on. But when we look at these four creatures this morning, you know, each one of these creatures had their own deficiencies. Uh, and each one of these creatures, if you would think about it, were really not highly thought of, almost to the point of being despised. I mean, when you think about the ant, they weren't strong. The conies were feeble. The locusts had no leadership. The spider being despised. Uh, or all of them, perhaps. I mean, when was the last? The only time you really think about the ants is when they invade your cupboard. Right when they come into the home, then you put the stuff out, then you spray them, then you kill them. Or if you're like us as kids, you know, you'd go to the ant nest with your magnifying glass and you'd get that sun beaten down really well and you'd start and the smell of burning ants. You know, it's like, oh, brother, we're praying for you. Hey, a lot of boys did it, right? A lot of boys. Did it. So when you think, you never really think about ants, right? Sister Jean, good morning. And then when you think about conies, then you say, what is a cony? Well, really, a cony is a small, almost like what we would say in Australia, like a hare, like a rabbit, a large rabbit, a hare. Um, you know, and Lucy, good morning. And, and in Australia, rabbit, I mean, you're not even allowed to have rabbits as pets in Queensland, okay? So rabbits were vermin. Rabbits were, were, were despised, just like the ants were, especially when they get in, like I said, when they get into your cupboard. Or the locusts. Who who loves the locusts? You know what I mean? Like, you talk about the plague of locusts in the Bible. Uh, I remember when I was a kid in South Australia, locust plagues in the wheat farming areas and probably spread all the way through into WA. The locusts are despised. And then you think about a spider. Well, who loves the spiders? Like, who welcomes them into your house? You know what I mean? Who loves the fact that you see spider webs in the corner of your house? And it's like, nah, you've got to move on, spray them, get rid of them, whatever. You know what I mean? So here are these four creatures that God 
gets us to pay attention to. He says, I want you to learn something. These are, these are little things, but exceeding wise. All right. So they may be little in stature, but they're great in wisdom. And we're to learn from them. You know, uh, so let's have a look at the first one. He says, verse 25, the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. All right. The ants are, Jack, you're probably about the only one (laughs) I love spiders. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. So the ants are a a creature that, that, remember that old saying, while the sun, uh, make hay while the the sun shines? So here here are the ants who are busy doing or preparing for the next season. So during a good season, they are storing up, they're going out, they're getting everything, taking it back to the nest because there are days that are coming that they won't be able to go out and find food. They'll have it stored there. So they prepare for the next season. Now, you know, the term seasons, especially when you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, um, you know, seasons in the Bible that are greatly mentioned. Uh, you often hear it preached about seasons of life. And to be honest with you, though we talk about four seasons or two seasons or whatever it is, and, and we think about you know a season being three months, and really a season could be three months, four months, and then the next one, you've got spring, summer, autumn, winter. You know all of that, right? You know, but in the eyes of God, when God talks about seasons, the length of a season is really determined by him. But what he says is that while things are good, while the sun is shining, be busy preparing because there may be days coming where it's dark, it's cold, you can't get out, right? So when you think about the seasons of life, what are you doing now in preparing for the next season? Most people, when they're in what we would call a good season of life, tend to just enjoy that season. Nothing wrong with that. Enjoy the good season. But while you're enjoying it, be busy preparing for the next season. Now, here's, here is the, um, here's the difficulty. The difficulty is preparing for the next season, but not living in the next season. We, we live in the season that we're in now, but we prepare for the next season. And when you look at this verse about the ants preparing, they're preparing for a bad season. Right? Seasons come, seasons go. Churches have good seasons, they have bad seasons. Families have good, they have bad. So it's the cycle of life. And so therefore, if you are in a, and I tell you what helps you sustain or sustains you in a, in a bad season what you do in the good season. So the ants are a busy people preparing their meat for the next season. Now, I was thinking about this when I think about meat. We're not just talking about something physical in the nature of food. We're talking about something spiritual as well. You know, the Bible is known as the meat of the word. So what's going to sustain you in a bad season that's coming Right? Now, it's not negative talk. This is, this is wise. We learn wisdom from these ants. What's wise is, is that you gather your meat now to help you in the bad season. So my, my advice to you is if you're in a good season, get a lot of the Bible into you. And the reason why I encourage you to get a lot of Bible into you doesn't matter how old you are. I don't care how old you are, as a matter of fact. You get the word of God in you. get the meat of God's word into you so that it will sustain you in that bad season because that's what you draw on. You're going to draw on the word of God as you go through a difficult time or a difficult period of life, okay? That's why it's important that you read a lot of Bible. Uh, and that's why it's important that churches have the meat of the word as well. Now, the thing about churches is that there's everybody at different stages of spiritual growth. So what I would encourage you to pray for your pastor about is that as he preaches that the message is uh, such that those who are new in Christ get something, but those that are older in Christ who need the meat, that anyway, there's a balanced diet, all right? You need a balanced diet, not just in your life, but in church life as well. But we're talking personally here. We observe the ants, they're busy. It's like now that they'll be out, they'll be gathering stuff because the, the, the storm season will be coming. It's going to be rainy weather. You don't see ants out and about when it's raining, right? Why? Well, they're in their nest 
eating that which they gathered in the good season because they knew a bad season was coming. It's a, it's a foolish Christian who won't, in this good season, prepare for the bad season. Now, let me just say this in regard. Now, I, I was, yeah, here's some more eschatology. There's a bad season coming. There's a bad season coming. There's already tribulation in the world. There's already wars and rumors of wars. And the closer to Christ's coming, the more intense, the more darker the day, right? The more difficult the season. It's in this time now that you ought to avail yourself much to the word of God. It's in this season now that, that you avail yourself much to being in the house of God because that prepares you for the season to come. All right, so the ants. Secondly, we see the conies. Look at verse 26. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. So again, the ants were not strong. The, the conies are feeble. So what do we learn from the conies? Well, they take advantage of what's already provided. Uh, wisdom makes the most of what God has provided. They can't build their own things. You know, you, again, talk about the cone, the march hare, the hares or the rabbit. I mean, they can't build stuff. I mean, they can dig their holes, they dig their burrows or whatever, um, but they're looking for somewhere strong. And, and when you think about, especially when I think Australia, you think about all the rabbit warrants, foxes can get in there. Uh, goannas can get in there and all that sort of stuff. So they need to find themselves places where they're going to be pr protected. So they take advantage. God, look, God has already provided for the conies, these rocks and everything. And wisdom says, hey, why reinvent the wheel? Someone's already done the work. Let's make the most. Let's take advantage of what's already there. And I tell you, brethren, we learn a lot from these conies that we, Nikki, good morning, that we should take advantage of what God has already provided. And by the way, we looked at the other day, yesterday I think it was, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, that he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's already provided us all things. Take advantage. Take advantage of what God has already provided. So here is the conies. They knew their limitations. All right. They knew their limitations and they knew that they couldn't do as far as the rock. They can't move the rocks around. They can't pick the rocks up. They can't do all of that. Right. So they knew their limitations. They couldn't, but God could. And I love that. And I'm going to go back to Psalm 78 for a minute. Let me read this because this is something that was said about uh, God's people back in the day when they were in the... Uh, you know, wandering through the wilderness and, and what they were saying about the Lord and, and all sorts. And they said in verse 19, Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? And of course, the answer to that is, can he? Yes, he can. I mean, here are these folks. Now, look, they saw God do so many amazing things, didn't they? I mean, their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. The, the water came from the... I mean, that's just not usual, right? That was unusual to see water gushing out of rock. God did so many things. And here they are questioning him. Oh, God did this. But can he do this? You know what I mean? Hey, folks, let me tell you. We know our limitations. We know what we can do and what we can't do. And God expects that of us. God, God designed us that way because he wants to be relied on. He provides it. Take advantage. But God is saying to us, take advantage of what I've already provided for you. Make the most of what I've given you already. And we see that in the life of the Coney. So the ants... They are being, they are preparing for the next season. The conies are taking advantage of what's already provided. Now we've got the locusts. Verse 27, the locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. These guys, again, every one of these creatures, these animals, they're all despised by human beings, right? Except for Jack. Jack loves the spiders. I'm not a fan of them, right? I mean, I, I, you know, anyway, we'll get to the spider in a minute. But here we've got these locusts. Who loves the locusts? <laughs> Farmers hate them, right? But God is saying, look at this now. Here is the locusts. They have no king. They have no leadership, yet they're organized. Now, here is, here is the thought. Be organized. So the ants are preparing. 
The conies are taking advantage of what's prepared. Now we've got locusts that have no leadership. They've got no leader over them, yet they're organized. All right? They go about in bands and they go forth and, and, and they all go together. They all know what they're... And if you've ever seen a locust plague, you see them come in and bang, they swoop down, they devour and they go off. You know what I mean? And so therefore, these are, a, are an animal, God says. I want you to look at this. Though they have no leadership, they're an organized animal. They know what they're doing. And so what we learn from that is to be organized, show initiative, show initiative. You know, when you think about young people today, and I, I don't know whether young people watch or, or not, but, you know, work bosses still today love it when people show initiative. You know, it's great in churches, and, and maybe you're a part of the church. I know I'm part of a church where we've got people that show initiative, and I hope you're part of a church. I'm sure you are. Uh, there's nothing better than than seeing people take initiative. They take ownership. It's it's almost like, hey, you know, uh, this, this this is my church or this is my home, this is my work, whatever it is. I need to show initiative. You know, the the owner of a business just can't sleep in every day, right? It's like a pastor. A pastor can't just sleep in every day. He's there's got to be some sort of initiative. There's got to be he, he's got to be the boss of his own life, and you've got to be in a sense the boss of your own life. If you're single, if you're a single man or a single lady or whatever it is, show initiative in your life. And this is the great thing about work, about going out to work. And, and make sure you get your young people going out to work. Get them working in the home now. Get them, get them knowing what life is all about. Uh, you know, we've, we've been doing that with our kids for years now. You know what I mean? Like bills and all sorts and, and things of that nature. They, it's like our kids are not, they know that when they leave home, it's like, well, we'll just follow on. We still got bills to pay. We've got this and we got that. But we've got someone here that's got no leadership, but they're self-disciplined. Let's go to Proverbs. Let's go back to Proverbs 16 for a minute. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, he says this in verse 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So someone who can rule their own spirit is better than someone who can conquer a city. If you can, if you can perhaps conquer yourself, so to speak, if you can lead yourself, right? Instead of, instead of always being told what to do and always, oh, let's, let's you know, Lead yourself. That's what he's saying. Rule your own spirit, all right? The locusts knew this, that together they could accomplish much, okay? And they didn't need someone to say this, 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 this. No, they just did it, all right? So they were organized. Be organized. Um, some of you might have diaries or, or whatever. It's like, I know I have to. I have to have stuff down and calendars and all that sort of thing and this is happening and I've got to do this and Thursday this, whatever. You know what I mean? I'm sure you've got the same thing. You can't just sit back and wait for, you know, it's like, it's like my son, Robert, you know, he at the moment, he's doing a, uh, a, a course, uh, an NDIS course where he goes and his course is from uh, uh, somewhere about eight in the morning or nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. And then he goes straight to work and he works from four till 10 and so on. He's got all, and he's done it all himself. He's organized it all himself. He's gone out and he said, right, I'm going to, I'm, 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 he was approached to, to do this thing. He said, right, and he, he organized it. He got his own uh, security passes and all this sort of, did it all his own self. He didn't have anyone to tell him what to do. He just took that initiative. And now he's, he's doing like the course, the schooling, and then going off to work. And that is character building. That is great. I'm so proud of him. And, uh, you know, that's, that's taken the initiative. That's being organized. All right. Now let's get to the spider, the last one. All right. Here is this spider. Look at it. Verse number 28. The spider taketh hold with her hands as, and is in king's palaces. Now here is the spider. What do we learn from her? Well, the spider takes hold of opportunities. Now, similar to taking advantage of what's provided, but she takes hold of opportunities. Now, when you think about the spider, Again, if you if you like Jack, you love him, whatever, right? But you've got the spider out in the shed. That's like, well, you're out in the shed. That's that's your domain. I'm not going to bother you, right? There's your spider web, whatever. You're over there. But the moment the spiders come into the home, then 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 you know I, I don't want them in here, whatever. I don't want to get a spider bite. I don't want them to bite my kid. Away. So what do you do? You clear them out. 
So here we've got this, this spider that not only lives in the shed or live in the dark places where no one's going to bother them. So here is the spider who's now in king's palaces and she's taking hold of, of things in king's palaces. She takes, uh, she takes hold of opportunities because, folks, she's only going to be there a short time. Now, in a king's palace, I would say this. I'm not a king, but I would say this. The king would expect the palace to be clean. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine King Charles would be happy with spider webs all over the place. You know what I mean? And spiders running. He'd probably want it cleaned. He wanted it fumigated. He wanted all this sort of stuff. So what we learn from this spider is take hold of opportunities while you have them. Because opportunities are not always going to be there. We could say in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says there is, an, there is a great and effectual door open under me. There is this great opportunity that God has presented to me, and I'm going to make the most of that opportunity, right? Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. What's that redeeming the time? May, that, that term time there means a window. So all of us have windows of opportunity that are presented to us throughout our life and God is saying, if you learn from the spider, you will take hold of these windows of opportunity and make the most of it before you get cleaned out, before the window shuts, all right? So what we learn from these little creatures, these unlikable creatures, these somewhat despised creatures, the ant, the coney, right? The locust, the spider, God says, learn from it. They're exceeding wise. Learn from them. Isn't God's creation amazing? And so, folks, what I want to impart to you today is just be prepared for the next season. Prepare now for the next season. Okay, uh, Take advantage of what God's provided. Be organized and take hold of opportunities when they come your way. And that's wisdom. That is wisdom. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. We thank you for what we can learn. And I pray, God, that we would apply it to our life in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Thanks for joining this morning. Have a great day in the Lord. And I look forward to being with you tomorrow morning. Until then, God bless. Goodbye for now.